New year, new weave. This year, just leave. I don't worry about no one, cause Alicia got the keys. And <clears throat> if I ain't got you hooked by now, then you might wanna swiss this beats up and send out a beat for me. Welcome to episode 97 of the Often Beat Podcast, where I just realized my voice cracked. Like, you know, the epidemic in the 80s. <clears throat> but yeah, welcome to episode 97 of the Often Beat Podcast. As you may be able to tell by the intro, um, I've been waiting to get that off for about six months now. Not really, but, you know, took advantage of it since I remembered it before I started. Recording this January 1st at 4.49 a.m. Eastern, not Pacific. Just trying to be specific with you. Um, don't want to centralize your listening time zone, but um, it's a podcast, so just listen to it whenever the fuck you can. But yeah, um... Nothing to note of, you know, took a couple day extra break. I had opportunities to record, to be honest, but I was just, uh, I just didn't want to. I thought I'd give myself a little holiday break, uh, kind of refocus, you know, get, a uh, get things back to powing. Uh, apparently, you know what they say about power outages, um, when the lights don't stop me, just... Turn them off, and then you'll still charge me the same when my rent comes. And it's pretty ironic that you get an email for a draft notification of the rent coming out the same day, but that power outage happens. Not exactly a winning recipe. That's like a. That's like a asking for the ring back when you already paid it off, and they don't have to. It's like, all right, I'll just go fuck myself. She's like, ha, I know you have it paid off. You can't even get it repossessed. It's like, damn. She's actually got a point. I'm kind of fucked here. That's what happens when you move to Papano Beach. Because the set of a beach. Um, but yeah. Uh, I really, like, if you're here to listen to New Year's resolutions... I am not the guy, but I'll give you a couple. I'm not going to tell you my resolutions because I don't really have any. Um, it's going to be pretty much the same. Same shit, different day. Um, still getting lectured about what I should or shouldn't do, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but yeah. Oh, this is going to be a great one. You know it's going to be a great one when you are already saying, oh, yeah, and putting in filler words to fill your ears up with complete, complete legendary archives for the future. This is actually my first podcast ever done in January. Woo, facts. And it'll be next month, it'll be the first podcast done in February, the month of that March, the month of that April, the month of that May. And then I can't say that after June because then I've covered a podcast in every single month of the year. Yes. Pour me, pour me another drink, because I don't want to fill it another day on this earth. Oh, hell no. By the way, Broadway Girls with Morgan Wallen. Well, it's actually a little Dirk feature Morgan Wallen, but let's be honest. Um, little Dirk's verse is kind of forgettable, and Morgan Wallen actually really carries the song. Not going to lie, I was very skeptical. And by skeptical, I literally mean I listened to the song Broadway Girls the first night, like, or like technically the day after it came out. First time I listened to it. And anytime I see a country and uh, when I see like a country and a rap artist do a song together, it's basically just going to be a rap beat and it's just going to be a country singer like doing half decent rap and that's being generous most of the time. Or the chorus is just meh. And it just seems kind of forced. It seems very quote-unquote industry-ish. By the way, industry baby. 
I, I got around to it, Lil Nas X and uh, uh, Jack Harlow, and that's not a country rap fusion because it's not. But I just, the song itself, "Industry Baby," I don't care for the music video. Um, I only saw a clip of the music video because on Spotify, when you click on a song, certain songs where it has the music video kind of attached. It's just a lot of blurred out nudes of him dancing, which is, I was like, all right, I'll just listen to the song instead. So, listen to the song, Jack Harlow's verse, fire. It's actually a pretty catchy song, not gonna lie. I'm not a big Lil Nas fan, X fan, not because of any of his personal stuff. I just actually don't really, um, I'm, I didn't really care for the song Old Town Road personally. And the other songs of his that were kind of eh, um, you know, I just never got into it, but that song I actually kind of like. But anyways, back to Broadway Girls. Um, typically those type of uh, those type of duets and songs and combinations they seem forced. Like it seems like the song is just kind of forced. It seems like it they're not rememberable. Like you know, with one of my favorite artists, Sam Hunt, there's a song with him and Breland called My Truck. Don't touch my truck. And honestly, like, it was a pretty nice song to listen to for a week or two, and then I haven't really listened to it since. But it was it was cool. But this one's a little bit different, because this one actually, it, was, it actually has looped in my head. And the first time I, li- actually the first two times I listened to the song, I didn't get it, I didn't feel it. I was just like, oh. But then, like, I didn't listen for a couple days in the chorus of, of Morgan. Do things right now. It was actually cool. And I think the music video actually makes it cooler. Like, I would recommend if you haven't listened to it, or even if you have, if you haven't watched the music video, I think actually it makes the, uh, it makes the listening experience a whole lot better. <clears throat> and typically, you, you could say, if the music video and the visual, if that's what makes the experience of the music better, then the song itself is, may not be that strong. And in some cases, I would agree with that. But this case, I highly disagree. Because I actually think the song is actually pretty good. But if you just listen to it on a playlist, it will just kind of, it could just kind of mix in if you're not paying attention and you're not aware. Now, I'm not even going to get into... Morgan Wallen, like his controversy type of shit, because, you know, um, I think it speaks for itself. I don't condone or support it. It's like, but Lil Dirk, they did a song together. So, <clears throat> I think you can not condone, but then you listen to the song with him, Lil Dirk, you're like, hmm, shit's kind of fire. But, I also don't get, I will say, one thing I never got with the whole Morgan Wallen thing it always just seems like there's a strong fan base. To... Now people are making like, oh my God, it's good to see Morgan Wallen bounce back from such such a tragic event. It's like, eh, I don't know. It was pretty self-inflicted. Um, no one made him do whatever, it, what took place. Um, the idea of a doorbell kind of recording you secretly, that part's kind of weird, but you know, that's like if you listen to a door, if you, if a doorbell catches, if a doorbell catches something that exposes a lot about someone, um, it doesn't necessarily mean the action is automatically deemed innocent or not wrong. It just means the way it was caught was kind of sketchy, but I'm not going to get into that. Um song's pretty nice, though. Not gonna lie. Um, but yeah, I recommend Broadway Girls. Alright, um... Yeah. So, uh... Nothing like some pastel paintings. Where you get the paint and paste. Why is it called copy and paste? Why, why is it, why is, why is it copying and pasting when you like, uh, you know, like if you're on your computer or even, even if you just write out verbatim something, right, from something else, why is it considered copy and pasting? Wouldn't it be called duplicating? Wouldn't it be called, 
a direct transfer? Why isn't it when we do uh, direct deposits? Or how come how come when we move when you send someone three hundred bucks? Why isn't that called copy and pasting? Why isn't it when you get your paycheck? Why isn't it called copy and pasting? I don't know. Just a thought. A terrible thought, but a thought. Um, but yeah. Uh, drops of Jupiter in her hair. Uh, yeah. Trains. Underrated movie. Taking Capella 1, 2, 3. Um, pretty, pretty good movie. That's all I have to say about trains. <laughs> Playing trains and automobiles. Don't really remember that movie, but I'm just kind of aware of the title. And isn't it funny how people who don't believe in titles somehow want you to make sure that you say their title? Um, it's like when people try to correct you when you say their name wrong, right? It's like, I'm sorry you have like a nine letter first name and you have a Z and a Y in there and it's kind of all out of place. I'm sorry if I miss say your name. I am. But to get an attitude about it because people don't get your name right, I think it's a little over the top. Um, it's like, to me, I just don't get the frustration. I mean, I guess I can understand being frustrated if people always get your name wrong, but if if it's understandable why people on first, second, third tries would get your name wrong, someone who has never met you before, someone who reads your name on a piece of paper, and it's a little like, hmm, I don't know. I think it's a little it's a little over the top. It's a little brash to just all of a sudden be assumed. I say this because I was... I was at a I was at a hangout spot, let's just say, right? And I was inside and this lady came in and uh this lady went to the front and he said, Oh, do you have an on the go order for Charlene? And she said, It's Sherlene. And then he looked down and he's like Okay, well, there's an A here. She's like, well, there's supposed to be an E. It's like, well, I mean, look, we only need to get into the fact that you're the one that typed in your name incorrectly, but it's cool. But let's just say, hypothetically, there was an E there. Let's just say there was an E there. Does it fucking matter? You obviously know there's going to be no other fucking Charlene or Sherlene or, you know, Shay Bean, uh, Maybelline. Um, there's going to be no anything to share or cherish. <laughs> oh, fuck you. Um, but the fact that on New Year's Eve on top of that, and yeah, the fucking, the stones, the kidney stones on this cunt to be like, it's actually Sherlene. Or Charlene. See, I don't even remember the order. See, this bitch fucked me up. Was it A or E? Either way, he said the one letter and it was actually the other. And I had my earbuds in, so I only kind of heard it because it was in between songs. I just hear this little mm, buzz of an announcement. And he handled it like a pro. He told her to suck his dick. Nah, he didn't. He actually just like, my apologies, even though. I know he had nothing to apologize for, but it's cool. I'm here speaking for the unspoken, even though it technically applies to me. But yeah. Um, it just, uh, I, don't, I don't understand this heavy need to want to correct someone. It's like if you make a comment. Like, I made a comment on a YouTube video, and honestly, I caught myself, right? Because it didn't change the guy's point. I did exactly what I would hate. So, uh, uh, Kirk Cousins, he's out for week 17 for COVID. Quarterback for the Vikings, blah, blah, blah. And 
someone was in the comment section of I forgot what it was, but basically somehow the things have come up of because they're gonna start another quarterback instead of another quarterback, younger quarterback that people think they should start, which it's obvious they shouldn't. He's not ready, but whatever. And someone made a comment. You have to really be actually in sports to actually know this next reference. But he said, this is like last year when Doug Peterson inexplicably started Nate Sudfield over Jalen Hurts in the last game. Because there's a lot of controversy because the Cowboys, if the Eagles would have won that game with who they were facing, the Cowboys would have went to the playoffs and... The Cowboys were mad about that, blah, 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 which I always say with shit like that with scenarios where someone's got to win or lose for you to get in. Don't put yourself in positions where someone has to win or lose to get in because you can't really bitch about when you put yourself in a position where whatever happens, happens, right? That's why be in control of your own shit. Story of life. Anyways, um, own your baggage, but... uh. Uh, or just carry on to the Clint Express, because I will, you know, not even weigh your baggage. Just say, like, yeah, throw it on. You know, we uh, we pay, we have good insurance on here. <laughs> but uh, but the dude made a comment that said, "This reminds me inexplicably when Doug Peterson started Nate Sudfield over Jalen Hurts." It's like, well. And I did the nitpicky thing. I said, well, Nate Suffield didn't start over Jalen Hurts. He actually was substituted essentially about halfway through the game. Actually, I think it was like halfway through the third quarter, if I'm more correct. But I caught myself after. I'm like, it's not incorrect what I said. But it doesn't really change the point the dude was trying to make. Because the dude, you know, for whatever reason, you could say, so, yeah, the fact that there was no reason they were going to start playing Nate Sudfield and learn anything or whatever. It's like you were going to get experience and reps for Jalen Hurts and then you benched whatever to make some shit happen. And it just kind of like, oh, I did it. I caught myself. But it would be like if someone, if you make a whole great point of why the environment is being fucked up by plastic bottles. And sea turtles are swallowing on straws. It's like, has turtles ever thought to like keep your mouth fucking closed? Like, have they ever thought of that? I understand it's really sad when you see those straw pictures. Like, damn, keep your mouth closed. Like, you don't just go underwater. As a human, I understand, you know, they actually live underwater. But, you know, as people... You don't just walk around with your mouth open, bugs fly in, you know, freaking anything to just fly in your mouth or come in your mouth. Keep it closed. Um, that's not what Bruno Mars meant when he said, leave the door open, which by the way, the analogy of that song, it just started to hit me. I don't think he's literally talking about leave the door open for her to come over. I think he means... Leave the door open if you get my drift. Sliding door, screen door, it don't matter. Just leave the door open. But anyways, it's funny how like the close and that could be one of those overthinking things where the more you listen to a song, the more you start to overthink it and think it's about something deeper philosophical meaning from really it could it probably is just just uh, leave the door open in case I wanna come by. But of course we always have to think it's, oh, look at him. Looking so deep beyond the pell. It's like, huh, beyond the pell in comparison. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I just think, uh, what was I talking about? I really think the more I <clears throat> have to, I do that like three times a podcast where I ask myself, what was I talking about? Is that a sign of dementia? Is that a sign of legit memory loss? Does that mean I'm not focused? Probably. But, uh, yeah. Also, I really need to look into the camera. I'm going to do that the rest of the show. Not looking down, not looking up, looking at you. Even though most of this is going to be audio listeners anyways. But you know what? Fuck me. Um, but, yeah. I really think 
that sugar pie honey buns. Oh, sugar honey iced tea. No matter how mad you are at the gas car. <laughs> um, well, I don't. I will say, I don't understand the. Oh, here's why. I came across this. Um, so, as you guys know, there's this zombie drug, quote unquote. Shit, what the fuck is the name of it? Jesus. Flocka. Yes, Flocka. Like Waka Flocka, but Flocka. F L A K K A. Basically, it's people are basically smoking this flocka is like this extreme crack weird shit that makes you like a zombie type of stuff. And it's really taken over Florida, but it's kind of scattered around really the like <clears throat> if you go on YouTube, I want you to type in <clears throat> excuse me. I want you to type in Kensington, Pennsylvania. And Skid Row or Kensington, Pennsylvania drugs. And the sights that you see on that shit is scary as hell, for one. is literally people <clears throat> out here, like, they call it the zombie drug because it legitimately makes people, like, do these weird zombie, like, they're bent over, like, you know, like... When you used to stand up in gym class for warm-ups and do toe touches, but you're, like, standing up and you're bending your body over to touch your toes type of shit. Imagine that, but with, like, an arch back and no control of your limbs, and you're just looking dead down. And people, the weirdest part is, like, we, you know, we all walk past, like, people that you tell are on drugs or homeless and stuff. We all just kind of walk past and don't want to be awkward. We just go around and shit. But it's like, you could tell the people that were walking past them in the city and stuff. You could tell, like, they just become so numb. Like, there's typically still a level of civility that still is maintained even when people are on, like, that type of stuff. Or when people are homeless and we typically... You know, we be civil and we just kind of go through it between each other. We'll go down the streets or whatever. But they were just going around these people while they're doing all these, you know, oblong. Uh, literally looks like they're doing like some weird robot dance. I'm not even trying to be funny. But I saw this Vice story, right? And it got me to thinking. So they went to... They went to this Florida, basically this trap house, where basically, you know, it's a distribution, the middleman, all this shit. The dude who's wearing the mask and stuff to protect his identity, which I kind of find it weird when they protect their identity, and they blur their face into all this stuff, but they showed literally in the hallway, walking up to the door, and even had the number on the fucking door, like any half-ass idiot could realize Anyone that's ever been that area or so the hundreds of thousands, millions of people that are going to see this video, they're going to be like, hmm, that hallway looks familiar. Oh, I went by with a friend like, oh, I know where that is. And then they're going to really just have the cops raid it and all that shit anyways. But what's crazy to me is people are saying... So I'm going to compare it to this, right? Because Pat McAfee and Aaron Rodgers also saw another story simultaneously where this uh, writer for Deadspin is saying, and plenty of other people too, are saying Matt, Pat McAfee needs to be held accountable for letting Aaron Rodgers spread misinformation about the stuff. I'm not even going to say it because I'm actually going to start worrying about copy or uh, being... Uh, what's the word, uh, hidden in the YouTube sphere or being, or being blackballed or whatever the, I'm just not there mentally, fuck, fuck this shit, but yeah, you, you know what I'm fucking saying, um, and it, it got me to thinking of, 
she's saying that Pat McAfee should be held accountable for what Aaron Rodgers says on this show. And I don't understand why is a person responsible for what someone else says on their show. For one, it's like, if that person is responsible for the other person says, that means they should only literally know every question that they ask and what every answer they're going to get from every guest. And if that's the case, what's the point of having shows where we are surprised as guests, where there's improv, when there's stuff on the cuff, when there's actual real conversations happening with any guests they have on? You may have a good idea what someone's going to say, but to sit here and say verbatim, you got to like send in the answers to the questions we have before we answer. It's like, you know what? Then you can have your dumb fucking magazine interviews where you have those people. And then guess what happens when you have those magazine interviews where it's literally typed up and everything? That's when you have, oh, two months later when it comes out and then the person that gave in and turned in all those answers and they see how it's worded and put they're like yeah I didn't mean it like that and they're like well this is what you typed in and that's when you have this context and all that bullshit but hey fuck it right if it's actually a visual representation and there's actually context where you can watch beginning to end and there's no in between of how it's interpreted more times than not instead of written form because written form could be the most because in human visual form or in just human conversation, you can say something, but you could tell by someone's tone, by someone's uh, behavioral and the way they deliver it and how it's one meant and two, how it's um, actually intended and what they actually mean by it. Where when you do it like when where you do it in a written form, that's why books can have so many interpretations. Eight people could read the same book and have six to seven different interpretations. That is fact. You can ask, what is the meaning of Harry Potter? Some people say, oh, it's it's about the bonding of of orphanage kids and all this shit. It's about finding it's about finding hope and despair. And some people just say, nah, just a bunch of kids playing wizard. Playing Dungeons and Dragons, Wizard Hordes, and all that shit. Like, it really just, however you want to interpret you can think everything's so simple, everything's so not simple, everything's got this deeper underlying meaning, and sometimes it's just not there. But when you say it, you can look back, break it down, and what it means, right? Now, going back to the Vice thing about this flock of drug where they go to Trap House, they do this port of investigate journalism why are they not being held accountable when they know where all of this shit is and they did not turn it into the feds of where the location is now I understand they would not even have been able to get into that room or get into that distribution type of shit the trap house or even go deep into the laws of going on the street and all this shit of interviews they did without the protection of legally not uh, basically NDAs and not exposed in their location but they are basically seeing all this shit happen watching it happen and letting the farm the distribution contribute to more people getting fucked up on this zombie drug now why aren't Why isn't a company like Vice held accountable when they know exactly where all this shit is coming from, or at least a place where it's coming from, and have it raided, and have all the drugs confiscated? Why is that? Why aren't they held accountable when they know where the shit's happening, but, for example, Pat McAfee on his show should be quote-unquote held accountable for something another grown man says on his show? You realize that would be like you going, having dinner with a couple of your friends, right? And you're sitting at a round table. Let's say you have four people. Let's say you have two couples. Let's say you're in a double date. That would be like you and your wife or you and your girlfriend being held accountable for something that 
your double date that your friend and his girlfriend say being rude to a waiter, saying something rude to a waiter. That'd be like you're talking about something and someone overhears something they said, but since you're at the table with them, even though you may not share their views, or even if you do share their views, but maybe you're not exactly just like, oh my God, yeah, oh my God, someone's got to say it around. But just the fact that you're in proximity to them and you volunteer to go because of that would be like you being held accountable for that. That would be like you being held accountable for murder just because you knew the guy who murdered someone. And you happened to be a mile away when that happened. You realize how like kind of idiotic that sounds? Be held accountable for what other people say. If you want to say Aaron Rodgers spread misinformation, that's fine. Like That's not what I'm talking about. Talking about why is it a person's responsibility for what someone else says on their show. So you just want a bunch of people to echo what you say. You just want a bunch of people. If you were to have a show or if you do have a show, if you have any type of anything where you publicly speak to tens, hundreds, of thousands, millions of people, you just want to talk to people that think like you. You just want to talk with people That only spread one message. When the beauty about everything that you would not like about that is that that's exactly what you're having when you bitch about people having people on their show that have, let's just say, controversial, polarizing opinions about things. And I don't like to always resort to Joe Rogan, but since he is a hot topic of conversation for a lot of reasons... You can't, you can't say he's responsible for stuff his guest for what his guest says, because he has a multitude of people from all different facets of life on his show, which is not something that your favorite host can say, not something that your favorite TV uh, station would say, because they don't have everyone on their shows. They don't. Your favorite channel wouldn't even consider some people. To ever be on anything involved with the network. And for these people. I honestly believe a lot of these people. If they were given an invitation. To come on a show with someone they disagree with. Or someone they believe is spreading misinformation. If let's just say. They were given an invitation to go on Joe Rogan's show. Or Pat McAfee's show. To counteract what's going on. And what they actually feel about them. I don't think they would take the invitation. Because I think they know. Attacking them. Having the biggest platforms. Really in their respective spaces. And what they do. Pat McAfee in sports media. Joe Rogan and just all media. Really. When you break it down. You want to talk about the numbers. Um, it's really. It's really quite fascinating. That. It's. Just because the size of their platforms, they're responsible for everything else. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Because what makes their platforms or what makes their shows great is the fact that, one, they're entertaining. Two, you honestly don't know what the fuck you're going to get sometimes, which makes it interesting. He literally... You know, it it just, I know I'm kind of all over the place, it's not thinking straight, but it's just kind of, I don't think people would take, the people that are the loudest and opposed to everything about Aaron Rodgers, or everything opposed to Pat McAfee, quote unquote, being complicit, letting it happen on the show, which is kind of weird. One, because I believe a lot of media networks, who they're trying to shame Pat McAfee publicly. You can sense the little digs from other companies. And all this. They try to do things to make sure people can't go on the shows. They try to specific employees speak like out against 
uh, Aaron Rodgers on his show. And by ironically, honestly, they're doing is giving him more publicity type of shit, which is kind of what they don't want. But what's fascinating to me is that he gets all the interviews from all the players without all the cliche bullshit that they don't get. They couldn't, they don't even get a sit down Sunday pregame kickoff interview with Aaron Rodgers to say cliche stuff. He actually gets Aaron Rodgers to say, even though the the actual stuff, you know, the stuff I'm talking about, is only actually like 2% of the interviews percentage they've done this year. And most of the time, it's really just Aaron Rodgers talking about football and life and shit. It's just when all this stuff has happened, he's been more outspoken about stuff. And honestly, I just don't think he gives a fuck anymore. But... I think what it really exposes is people are trying to find a way to tear down. And they're also saying now that, oh, I don't think it's right because he he's he got this. He got a bag. He got a four year, like one hundred twenty hundred thirty million dollar deal from Fandle to essentially be sponsored by them. They're the sole sponsor. They have like pro they have like um partnerships and things and people are saying the promotion of gambling is bad and the fact that one of the bigger sports media platforms it's bad that the sole thing about it is gambling because there's a lot of gambling addictions it's like okay but they have no problem when people promote alcohol they have no problem when people uh promote things that are harmful but gambling, oh gosh, because you have a second cousin that has a gambling addiction, which has led them being broke and falling into other addictions. Hey, it's not their problem, man. Because you have no problem when you see someone advertise McDonald's. You have no problem when someone advertise anything that's unhealthy for the body. But gambling, oh, it's such a bad influence. It's such a bad influence for society and for the younger teenage kids. It's like, honestly, I, I'll be honest, like, I'm not a big fan of watching. Now it seems like even I was watching like a CBS Sports highlights things because I, I was watching the highlights of the college football games and like each like college bowl game they were playing highlights of. It was what was the over under and points and the, against the spread. And I don't even know what half that shit means. I kind of do, but I really don't. Like a lot of that shit's starting to get obnoxious in the mainstream. But it's like, all right, whatever. It's just numbers. You ignore it and you watch the screen. It doesn't make me want to go gamble. And that's just a me thing. But I don't know. Maybe if TV influence you want to go gamble. Or go do anything. I think you have other issues. But let's say you do have a prior gambling issue. Seeing we are sponsored by FanDuel. It's like oh shit. I'm missing out. It's like. Look man. Get over it. And these quote unquote journalists. Who want to make it. About something it's not like. Pat McAfee has done much more good. With what he's had. Do you know what he did when he got the money? He donated like millions and millions of dollars to his hometown. Like just watch. Like just go on the Pat Mag And listen to the massive announcement reaction thing. And what they did on the day they signed the deal. And all the money he gave away to his hometown team. Uh, upgrades and facilities to this place. Or charities and all that foundation Stuff, local communities, building rec centers and shit, like, and then you're just bitching about because he used that money and actually upgraded something in his hometown, actually contributed back to his hometown or contributed back to his current situation, his, where he currently lives or wherever, and you're sitting here saying, he should be held accountable for what someone else says on the show. I'm going to look at more what he's done. Because he's done a lot more good with a lot of money than I think these quote-unquote 
uh, moralist journalists would do if they had that type of money. Because you know what they do? They would get that type of money and they would be tone deaf bitching about how people make too much money and ignore the fact that they make a lot of fucking money and don't do anything to contribute back. I think we just assume that people that talk morally high, that people that talk with such great morale of themselves, we just assume if they if they switch position with the people they were bitching about that they would actually do better with it. And I can honestly sense with the way how someone carries themselves, how much they complain and bitch about something. Because what would you do you got money? You would put money into things that would just be more complaining and bitching instead of fucking actually just making something better and taking advantage of, you know, your fortune that you now have. So anyone saying that someone's responsible for what someone else says, go fuck yourself. All right. All right, I'm going to round this up with some terrible New Year's wisdom. All right, here's your unwarranted wisdom of the day. Episode 97, Unwarranted Wisdom. Three, two, one. <clears throat> For every new year, there's a year to be renewed. Kind of like your lease. When the taxes are due. Even when the power goes out, you'll be out with power that you cannot see the light without, even when you pay your shit on time. But wisdom doesn't come with glee. Wisdom comes for those in need, and wisdom comes for those who see for what it really is. But the most important part of a new year is that you're not just renewing another year that you copy and paste. Let's see what I did there. You're living another year to copy at your own pace. Because there's nothing wrong with living the same life you lived last year. If That's the life you want to live every year. But. There is something wrong. If you live past. The year. That's already passed. Because once you think ahead of the curve. The curve will typically round up. And let you know you're not the exception. But you're always the rule. And the rule doesn't curve your grade for the new year. All right, guys. That is episode 97 of the Off and Be Podcast. That was actually not a bad wisdom uh, poem rant. Whatever you want to fucking call it. Off the cuff, baby. Yeah, that episode sucked. I'm actually kind of pissed. I probably shouldn't even release it. But you know my rule. I release even when... God says, can you please just not, could you please not, it's like, sorry Jesus, um, you're the one that created the sun like this, you're supposed to end it 2012, but I'll just uh, say, hey, stop a mine, you little whore, that's not something you should say, um, but yeah, alright guys, like and subscribe, uh, episode 97, don't forget to suck some titties. And hopefully you don't listen to this with your kids. Um, which, if you are just now figuring to not listen to this with your kids in the car, I think DFAC should honestly take a review of your parenting folder and give you a very deep, legitimate review of, hmm. See, they need to, you know, before I cap, you know, they really need to do a... No, they should really do with driving. They should really do with a lot of things. Like, you know, every year, you know, you have to renew, you know, you have to, for some reason, renew your tag every fucking year, which is so fucking dumb. And you have to get an emissions test to, re- or emissions test to renew your tag. Like, all this bullshit semantics, whatever nonsense. 
Like, all right, you know what? Maybe like every seven years, you should have to retake the driver's test. Or like at least every like seven years until like after three times and you're good. And you know what? They should do the same thing. Like every household of parenting should get like a review, like a graded review from defects or the government. Well, I don't know. Then you have shadiness there. So maybe that's not a great idea. But in the perfect ideal world, yeah, maybe have like a, you know, get kids out of bad situations when they're eight years old. When, you know, there's still a chance to save them instead of like, hey, sorry, kid. I know you're getting beat the fuck out of by your mother, but, you know, she did, uh, she did. Let you come out of the birth canal. Um, she did push you. She just pushing you to be great. It's like, yeah, but when I tell her that, she says, fuck me. It's like, yeah, please take me away. It's like, yeah, can't really do that. She's your mother. Um, but yeah, maybe they should do like every, maybe like every five, every three to five years until you're like 12 when they have a good like amount of data on you. Of, yeah, you know, they have a good track record. Like, they seem to give a fuck. Like, you know, maybe... Maybe, um... Keep parents on edge. Make sure they're doing the part, you know? It's like if you're on a job for, like, six years, you're gonna get a little comfortable. You're not gonna be on top of shit. You're probably not gonna be as caring. You're not gonna be as diligent in the safety health protocols and all that shit. But when you have kids, it's like, hey, oh, shit, they're coming in three months. If they treated renewing your kids like you have to do your taxes every year i mean parents would be much nicer to kids because you know it would be like when you uh have company come you know you're vacuuming clean the house dusting and shit you know you're gonna do that for defects and by default you don't have to actually do shit but yeah just a thought all right suck some titties have a great day that terrible episode that's fine every episode's fucking terrible this year oh yeah happy new year's Even if you don't really deserve to really be here.